and let's see once this gets going. Okay, here you go. And let's dive into our topic today. <clears throat> okay, as we can see on the screen now, what we're going to cover today is return to stock and addition to stock. I'm going to start with return to stock because I have added uh, the notification process to this one. I want to do the full exercise so you guys again refresh uh, your mind with the notification process. We'll do some reservation. We're going to again do the uh, Migo transaction and then of course the transactions for put away right into warehouse. So this is a, a quite a complete exercise as well. Now what's uh, important before we get started is to understand what return to stock and addition to stock means. And if you're going to be performing this in the system, the, the types of situations that you may encounter when you're uh, deployed to the mission. So if I go to my body of the exercise, right, where we have the details, I have added uh, some comments here and some details from the actual job aid. Okay, so related to exercise on day four, which is return to stock. I added here a couple of uh, explanations. For example, after the Umoja go live, right, the return to stock into inventory was possible only uh, in the following modality. So we have, for example, this uh, movement type Z01, which is return to stock at zero value. Okay, and this was to uh, was applicable uh, back to stocks uh, used items. And we had a basic uh, movement type for this specific transaction. But after uh, cluster three and cluster four go live, there were more scenarios that were added. And all this you can find right here in the job aid. If you just simply click on the link, the job aid will open automatically. And this explanation can be found here as well, okay? Basically the purpose of these transactions, this one for return to stock, the type of transactions you'll be performing and some background information that I have copied and pasted into the body of the exercise, which is this one right here, okay? So the job aid will help you definitely understand some processes that may not be explained in the exercise fully, okay? So we have to understand that there have been two situations here, one after the Umoja go live and the type of movement types that we have for return to stock, and then what happened after cluster three and cluster four go live we have added more transactions and more movement types. Now, I'm not sure which exactly you're going to be facing in liquidation. Maybe you'll face all of them and you'll have to perform all these transactions. The good thing is that the steps are the same in terms of uh, what we have to follow. The ones that I have uh, added here to the cover page in terms of the summary of T codes and process and steps. But of course, the uh, movement types used are going to be different. Okay, you see that for scenario three, for example, we're using a different movement type for return to stock. And then Z43 for return to stock also. <clears throat> and depending on the type of movement and if it's budget relevant or the value of the items returned to stock, okay, the responsibility, the uh, scenario number four and the type of movement type used for that. So I recommend you guys take a read not only at the body of the exercise, but also take a look at the job aid before we start. Now, I'll throw the question out there first. Uh, what type of uh, return to stock transactions will uh, students be facing when they're deployed? I think all of these may be possible, right? The scenarios that we have here, uh, basically the one for uh, after Umoja Go Live and the one for cluster three and cluster four. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I think you guys will have to deal with each one of these transactions. Okay, I'm not sure which one will be more common, but I'm sure that you'll have to deal with each one of these. Any comment before I start on what we're just looking at? Maybe from those of you who have experience in liquidation? Uh, nothing in the chat, Brian. So far, so good. Okay, perfect. So let's get started with the demo that we have prepared today. Okay, and this demo, as we see here, the objective, right? To learn how to perform return to stock and the exception scenarios described below. Now, again, we're only going through one specific scenario, but again, the steps to follow are the same for all scenarios. The things that change are the movement types that we're using. And we'll see exactly when that movement type comes to play when we're doing reservation, okay? So you'll learn to uh, return to stock items received against purchase orders converted in Omoja without material master and not reported during the inventory conversion process. Goods received upon completion of a construction contract goods received with reference to a service contract and the receipt of PO delivery uh, overage at no cost. All right, we have here our uh, data. 
related to the materials that we're doing the return to stock for. I even have some extra data here just in case and the users and roles that we'll be using. So today we're going to be working again with T1E, but the client is going to be 510. So keep that in mind when you're logging into the training environment and performing the exercise. We're not doing 520, it's 510. Okay, keep that in mind as that should also be in your cover page. These are the users I'm using. They're not the same ones that you'll be using. And I also suggest that if anyone is following the session, don't use these users now to perform the exercise because you may block me from completing it. Something that is important and that you guys have to also keep in mind is that you see that for the users here at the top, the Umoja password is Umoja133. You see here, for example, we shouldn't have a space into any of these. Since I know that, I can just get rid of this space. So when I copy and paste, I don't have that issue. But you realize that all the Umoja passwords are 133 except for one of them, which is the inventory senior user, which is 123. And this one is going to be important when we approve the reservation. Remember yesterday, Elena was showing you that the inventory senior user goes into the inbox in ECC and sees a message for an approval of a reservation, and you just have to double click on it and approve it. So to log in as inventory senior user, the user is quite different, but the password is key, okay? It's Umoja123 instead of 133. So let's get started first with the login of the notification user. So we're going to start by creating another notification, and we'll refresh our memory from what we did yesterday. I'm going to log in first, okay, and click on the icon for SAP. And once Citrix loads, I'll make sure that I'm on client 510. And the environment is the same one that we've used so far. Okay, so here we are. Let's just make sure we open this. Remember, we're still using our training system here. It, this doesn't seem to be an issue. Everyone seems to be logging in correctly to T1E. Okay, and once I double click here, what I want to do is first uh, what I did yesterday and I told Elena to do because I can already hear about background noise in ECC. So you can always remove the audio options if you want to before you log in. Okay, I'm just clicking here on the TV screen, options, and then here interaction and design. You hear the sound in the background. When I click on sound settings, just make sure you take it off, apply, click on OK, and now the sound will disappear because I know it can be quite annoying. The client is 510, and now what I'm doing is I'm posting here, I'm pasting my uh, user, which is the one for the uh, notification user, and the password is umoja133, OK? And that works. If by any chance you have a mistake there when you try to log in, be careful, make sure you're copying and pasting everything correctly. The capital letters are there. If not, you'll block your user. Now, once I'm in, the first thing we'll do, again, we can always follow the cover page, as we see here. I can just simply go to my summary of transactions and go one by one, okay? Again, uh, if you guys see it here at the top, I also add some uh, T codes here for reports that are very recommendable. MM60, the stock overview, MMBE, um, and so on. I even have here a T code for the list of notifications, and we can take a look at that one. I'm not sure if we did that yesterday, but nonetheless, I'll show it again. Also to display single notifications and even to display functional locations. All right, even the reports for BI here. So let's start with our first step, which is IW51 create notification. I'm going on to Citrix again, and what I'll do is type IW51. So this is the Tico to create our notification. Before we get started with that, we see that we have a field here, notification type, right? And we see P1. What does that mean? Remember that uh, using the matchbox option, we'll have always a display of the options available to us and what they mean. If I'm selecting P1, it means I'm creating a notification for maintenance or service request. Okay, the PW, write-off, disposal, impairment, see, R1, UN service request, accident incident, uh, activity report. So there's different types of notifications that we'll select. And selecting one or the other, you'll see how the notification itself is different because there are different requirements for each one of them. So we can select P1, which is the one that we're going to uh, use for this exercise. And now there's even an option here to write your notification or to use a reference. Remember, we were using this yesterday. Now, in the mission, I believe uh, uh, all missions should have reference notifications already created, which in a sense are templates 
that you'll be using for specific actions that you're going to be performing in the system. If this is for enrichment, if this is for a return to stock, an addition to stock for a write-off, there's a different type of template. So the ones that you will be using in the mission should be available to you there. You should know which ones to use as reference. The ones we're using in the exercise are defined in the body of the exercise. So if I scroll down, okay, we have the login information and then we get to the part where it says create notification. All right, and the explanation is there step by step and we would be getting here to the add the following data and click enter. For example, notification type, use match code, select P1. And then I say here, add notification reference. And this is the one that we have in the training environment. Okay, and what this will do is in order to have the tasks defaulted. All right, so if I select this reference, and you'll see I'll copy and paste that into the system here. Now I can click enter and the system will return to me now a notification template, which is uh, for what I'm trying to do, right? So to return something to stock. You see, if I go to the task tab, as we did yesterday here, we should have a list of tasks already created. So step by step of what I have to do. First, create my notification, then approve it, then process check stock. So all of these steps are the ones that the system recommends you to do before performing any action. All right, you don't necessarily have to do them all because remember, you can get rid of some of them. For example, if I wanted to, uh, let's unclick these and say, okay, I don't need to ch um, check my stock. So maybe I want to get rid of that one. You simply select that line and then get rid of it with the icon here at the bottom, delete row, and that uh, item will disappear but you can also add new tasks as well. Okay, so it's not, what you see here is not written in stone. You can add things and delete things as you see fit. Use the ones, the items here below, for example, to select all, to view details, deselect, uh, remove, or simply add a new task, for example, here. Okay, and we can add a new task. See, I'm gonna get rid of this line. Do you really want to delete? Yes, and we can get rid of that line here. Okay, and actually, since I had the check stock, it's been deleted too, so I don't have to do that task if I don't want to. All right, so we have our list of tasks, and we're gonna go one by one. So the first one is create notification, and that's where I am. But before that, let's check and see what we're doing here. We see that our notification already has a name here, return IT device. And that is probably because I'm using the same user that I did for when I tested it the first time. So the system is telling me I already have an option here. Okay, I can uh, simply remove it and add a new name to it. We can go to the body and follow the instructions as they're all set here. Okay, see, add notification description and click on the notification tab. Okay, so we can add a notification test uh, text in this case before I go on to my next actions. So let's do that first and I can even write the same one I had. So return one IT device. Let's see what else the exercise is telling me to do. So under the notification tab, okay, we're going to add the equipment number and you have it in your cover page. Okay, equipment number from your cover page. So let's do that one step at a time. The equipment number under the notification tab that we have here, we're adding the equipment number that we're going to return to stock. All right. And in my cover page, I'll go here and make sure that I select the correct one. So we have our material and the equipment ID. Now, which one of the two should I add here? So I have material and then the equipment number. So in the body of the exercise, what it's telling you here is to add the equipment number, <clears throat> which means that... <clears throat> We should select the equipment ID here and say, okay, maybe this is the equipment number. Maybe it's the material ID here. Which one should we select if anyone wants to jump in and tell me so we can have a little more interaction before I get started in this particular field for equipment? Should I be adding the material? Should I be adding the equipment? I guess equipment. Okay. So... Here we go, we select our equipment number because basically that's what it's telling me, right? In the uh, field, it says equipment number, so I can add that there. Let's click enter and see what happens. So, uh, okay, it says that the reference is different from the uh, material that I'm adding. Okay, let's see, so I'm gonna click on okay. I have also a, uh, another pop-up window that tells me uh, everything that has been occurring with this 
a specific uh, computer or equipment device, right? In, and during uh, the process of, of time, for example, the notification created one because I guess I've done this once before for the same piece of equipment. So this is just an information pop-up window that tells you uh, what's been happening with this piece of equipment in the past. So we click on OK and look what happens. We have our equipment computer tablet. We have the functional location that is linked to it already. And if we keep scrolling down, we will even have some more information related to its main work center, the plant linked to it, also the plant here, but we don't have a planner group. Now, I don't know if we went through the explanation of these fields yesterday and what they mean, right? I know it's a lot of information, but still I'm going to try to explain it as simply as possible. The main work center that is linked to a specific equipment, right? If I click on this, for example, on the matchbox, remember, if you don't have enough information, always click on a matchbox and find out what type of information this is related to. So if I'm looking at ACM E001, ACM E001 here, what I'm looking is IT services. So what this is telling me is that the main work center responsible for this piece of equipment, right, that will be responsible for any sort of maintenance of this piece of equipment is IT, IT services. If we select the wrong one, for example, if I added here ACM A001, what I'm saying is that the interpretation services is responsible for an IT piece of equipment, okay, which the system should block me and tell me, hey, you're selecting the wrong work center. But there could be chances where it doesn't happen. So you always have to select the correct one. In this case, it populated automatically because it's linked to that one, which is a good thing. So in this case, if we select IT services, now we understand that this work center is responsible for any sort of maintenance that has to be done for that specific piece of equipment. But now we have another field here, the planner group. And what does that mean? Let's click on the matchbox again, and let's see what we're looking at. The planner group for this specific equipment, right? Is it general administration, conference, facilities management? So we have a number of um, planner groups that are responsible for this piece of equipment. Now, which one should I select? Well, probably it's gonna be this one, right? For ICT for anything related to IT equipment. But we have to understand the planner group is gonna be a, let's say a, an office that is responsible for anything that happens to this piece of equipment, right? So if we have to uh, do some maintenance on this piece of equipment, the planner group is the one responsible for starting to generate service orders to uh, perform any sort of transaction. But to this action, the one of the actual maintenance will be performed by the main work center. Okay, so one office is in charge of the details of creating an order to do a service, but the other office is the one that's actually going to be performing the action. So that's what's important here, and it's important for you to understand that what we're setting up here is the group that will be responsible for anything that happens to this piece of equipment and the group that will actually take action. All right, for this any sort of maintenance that is done to this piece of equipment. So right now we should have uh, everything we need, at least the basic requirements uh, for this transaction. OK, for the notification. But let's see. Let's go back to our body here and let's see what it tells me to do. So I'm skipping these uh, steps right now because I went to the planner group and so on. But I'm going to go back to it. If I go back to Citrix and I click enter, usually when you add information and click enter, the system is going to tell you if you need to do anything else that is required. In this case, if I click enter, the system is not telling me anything more. So I could interpret, okay, I'm done. Okay, my, my job is done and uh, the notification is ready. But that's not the case. There's a lot of uh, transactions and this is what also Joseph, Kenny and Gianluca were talking about throughout these days. The system should prevent you from uh, uh, skipping uh, required steps, right? For example, I think what's important here is also to add the coding, right? So the system should tell me, wait a second, you're missing important information. In the uh, body of the exercise, we see that we have to add the coding here from the matchbox. And what does that mean? Okay, let's see. Let's uh, select the coding here that's it, that it says UNASSN. So we go back, we see the coding, we click on the matchbox once again, and let's understand what each one of them uh, stands for. So we see coding UNASSS, this is assignment, okay? But if I unfold this, we have other 
uh, sub options for assignment. We can select assignment, which is what Elena was doing yesterday for her notification. But in this case, what we're doing is return. So we would have to select UN01. We also have swap, transfer, and so on. We have more options you see for building maintenance. We have other options for disposed, cannibalization, sale, and we'll be seeing these during the write-off process. Okay, but it's important for you to understand what we're doing at each step of the way. If this is physical verification and we're adding notifications on what's going on, or if this is simply a return. So in this case, it's a return, so we can double click and we have it assigned here. Now we know that this notification has been created for a computer tablet. We're returning a device. We have assigned the code, which is return. We have also managed to add the main work center responsible and the planner group for this specific plant. We go back to our exercise here and let's see. It says add a description and use the following information in the text box. So we added the description return IT device, but this description is different. This is also, if you see here, not a mandatory field. So we can always add a bit more of the description that we added here at the top. Maybe we wanna say return IT device and even say what it is, right? For example, computer tablet. All right, we can add a little more information. We also have a text box on the bottom where we can add our entire life story if we want to. Okay, remember yesterday, this was an important text box that we can add all the transactions that we've been performing. So if I have a Migo transaction that gives me a material document, maybe this is where I want to add it. Okay, if I have a reservation, this is where I want to add it to. So if we add these transactions and we put the numbers of them here, anyone who access this notification will know not only that the task, for example, has been completed, but actually the proof that it has been completed, right? The material document and the reservation number. So let me get rid of this for now because I want to start first probably with the reservation, right? I'll come back to this once I do my reservation and I'll add the number here. Let's see what else I need to add into my notification at first. So I added the first part of the information and it tells me here, scroll down in the execution section, select priority of the notification and select it as medium, required start date, today's date, the planner group and the plan. So I did this early, clicking on enter, it told me already what I needed to, <clears throat> sorry, what I needed to add and what was mandatory. So this part is done. All I have to do now is select priority and add today's date. So I'm going back to the notification. I scroll back down and I see that I'm missing the priority. I'm going to select here medium. It could be uh, any other very high, high, low, but I'm going to select medium here. And then the requirement start date here is says May 25th. So we don't have to start immediately, but at least we're indicating that this, the job for return to stock should occur on this day or the malfunction in this case, if we're talking about a malfunction, we should add the date of the malfunction too. So I'm gonna see what happens if I just leave this malfunction date blank because we're not talking about any sort of malfunction. We're only talking about a notification. And I can even add this uh, a notification for return to stock. I'm gonna to add today's date here and I'm gonna click enter and see what happens. And it says time only useful in connection with a date. Okay, so let's see. You want to specify new dates? I'm going to say no, that's what I want to select. So eventually it pre-populates my malfunction start date. All right, there. So what I have is my start date here, which is today, and all the other fields that I was talking about are already populated in my notification. I'll go back to the body and keep scrolling down and see what else it tells me. So again, you even have in the instructions to say no to the specifying new dates if you already added those new dates. And then it tells me a little more in the lo location tab, what we're adding, fill out the following fields. So let's see, we're still creating the notification and now we're adding the following fields that are related to the account assignment of this uh, piece of equipment. So what we're doing is we're adding information on the cost center, the business area and the maintenance plant. Let's see what has been pre-populated already. We go to the location data and since I already added my piece of equipment, to the uh, equipment field here, the system has already taken that information 
and has populated some fields here. For example, the maintenance plant is already populated. And at the bottom, we see the business area is there too. And even the cost center is there too. If this were a piece of equipment that wasn't in stock to begin with, maybe we should be doing a different process, addition to stock instead of return to stock. Because the return to stock process is for items that were in stock or were in inventory at some point, were used for some sort of transaction, let's say uh, in the building process, or any other transaction that these items were used for, and then they were returned to stock. That's why the, the main difference, and correct me if I'm wrong out there, but the main difference for return versus addition would be exactly that. When we're doing a return, the item is already uh, was already in inventory at one point versus addition, it wasn't. Now, other cases where that's not the case, and I'm throwing that question out there, return to stock is always for items that have been at one point in inventory or other cases were not. Okay, I'm throwing that question out there to you guys if somebody wants to jump in. Is that the case all the time? I'm not sure if you're, so, you're writing it in the chat as well, but return to stock is always for items that have been in inventory before versus addition to stock. It's for items that have never been in inventory before. Correct, correct, okay. uh, right. Very good, thank you. Okay, so we have our items here. We go back to our body and we see that we have the information added. We keep going down, okay, and uh, sorry if I'm uh, going through the body of the exercise, but I think it's very important for those of you who are not familiar with this process to understand that not only you have to uh, understand what you're doing at every point of the way, but that we're also describing it here. Remember, you can also send an email to the notification approver to let him or her know that uh, the part of the creation has been done. What else are we going to do here? Okay, well, Elena was doing yesterday. We're releasing the tasks at this point. And remember, the release of the tasks is basically an instruction that these uh, we're good to go, right? The, the, uh, the work can begin for this specific notification. So I'm going back here. I'm going back to my tasks. And I see that I have all these tasks here, but they have the status TSOS, okay? And let's see now if I select them all. Okay, here, I remember at the bottom here, we can say select all, and these should select all my tasks. And then we have another option for deselect, okay? So I'm gonna select them all, and what I'm gonna do is release them from this flag at the bottom, not the one at the top, because here we're talking about the notification as a whole. Here, we're only talking about the tasks. So if I release this flag, it's the tasks. If I com 